Welcome to the second spotlight, uh, sp spotlight session. And uh, first we have uh, George Chan, who is going to be talking about latent source model for online collaborative filtering. Hi, uh, my name is George, and I'm here to share with you some joint work with my co-authors Guy Bressler and Deverett Shaw. We're interested in setting online recommendation systems. So this, these are systems where uh, you recommend items to users over time. Uh, so you can think, uh, for example, Netflix or Pandora. And so uh, we, we consider a very simple uh, setup. So as you see on the slide, uh, at each time step, we are recommending exactly one item to each user for which the user consumes the item and then uh, rates the item either thumbs up or thumbs down. And so uh, what, at time t, what should we recommend to each user? And uh, what we want to do is c come up with um, the, the performance, like the, the, analyze the performance of a recommendation algorithm um, as a function of time. So uh, we impose a constraint on the system where uh, once you recommend an item to a user you're, uh, and the user consumes and rates the item, you're not allowed to recommend that item to that user again. So for example, if uh, let's say uh, Netflix recommends Plan 9 from Outer Space to me and I give it a thumbs up, it probably doesn't make sense for Netflix to recommend the same movie to me again. Um, and they probably wouldn't learn anything uh, new from doing so. So, uh, and, uh, so a fundamental challenge here is that uh, what you recommend now uh, affects how well you what you learn about the users, which affects your recommendations in the future. And so, the uh, question is: Well, how how do you um, how do you how do you uh, use what knowledge you already know about the users to recommend uh, an item to a user? So, uh, what's often used in practice is collaborative filtering. And so, a key question we want to answer is. Uh, when does collaborative filtering work well? So in, a, in its simplest form, collaborative filtering uh, rec looks at, um, figure out, figures out what item to recommend to, to a user by looking at similar users. For example, if Alice is similar to Bob and Bob likes apples, then maybe Alice likes apples too. So we, uh, we present some sufficient conditions for when collaborative filtering works well. In particular, we assume some structure in which uh, there are groups of users and each group has uh, similar um, item preferences. And also, we show that uh, we use two types of exploration, one to explore the space of item and one to explore the space of users. So uh, combining these ideas, uh, we present a, an algorithm called Collaborative Greedy, analyze the algorithm's performance under our model, and output a theorem and some plots. Thank you, and uh, I hope to see you at our poster. Now we're going to have uh, Xiao Hong Lim, who's going to talk about clustering from labels and time varying graphs. Thank you. Uh, this is joint work with Yu Dong Chen and Huan Xu. So we consider the problem of graph clustering, where we look for partitions, uh, partitioning of a set of nodes that maximizes some objective functions, such as uh, the density. So traditionally, uh, given a pair of nodes, the kind of uh, uh, observation that we have is whether uh, the two no uh, there's an edge or there's no edge between the two nodes. In many real life applications, uh, the kind of interactions between nodes that we can observe are much richer than just uh, edge or no edge. For example, uh, interactions between proteins uh, can be categorized into many different types. Uh, in social networks, uh, complex interactions uh, can be observed between individuals. So a particular uh, motivating example for us is a, a time-varying graph where uh, the observed graph changes with time and we get to see a different snapshot in a uh, different time period. So how do we use all this uh, information uh, in a principled way and how do they influence clustering performance? So we uh, propose a graph clustering setting where the uh, pairwise uh, observation is in the form of a label. So a label is uh, an element of a label set which can be very general. Uh, they can be um, discrete or continuous or even a time series. Uh, our algorithm involves solving a uh, convex optimization problem uh, with an appropriately weighted uh, objective function uh, based on the observed labels. 
And uh, to evaluate performance, we use a generalized uh, stochastic block model uh, where we assume a, a true but unknown underlying clustering and uh, uh, a, gener a generative model for the observations. So our main theoretical results provide uh, sufficient conditions uh, for the exact recovery of the, this underlying clustering uh, with high probability. So in some cases, we provide uh, a matching necessary condition uh, indicating the optimality of the algorithm. So our results uh, cover many uh, existing graph clustering settings, and they also apply to new settings. In particular, we can derive results for time-varying graphs, uh, both for the simple case of uh, independent snapshots and also uh, a more complex one, such as uh, a Markov sequence of uh, snapshots. So these provide new insights on uh, uh, what kind of, uh, how, how the information we gain from uh, additional snapshots influence the uh, performance of graph clustering. So for further details, I welcome you to our poster number 68. Thank you. Next, we're having Wei Lu, who's going to talk about discrete graph hashing. Hello, everyone. My name is Wei Liu. Uh, I'm going to present a discrete graph hashing. This is joint work with Chen Mu and Shu Fu Chang from Columbia University and Sanjeev Kumar from Google Research. Okay, let us first introduce the graph hashing problem. The problem is given a graph, okay, this graph is represent us affiliate matrix A. And we want to learn the hash code matrix B okay, based on this graph hash work. Okay, there are three constraints, including the discrete constraint that require the binary code uh, to be from uh, to be drawn from uh, one and negative one. And uh, the second constraint is balance constraint that require the hash bit uh, have the maximum information or the maximum entropy. Okay, the last one is the uncorrelated constraint that re uh, restrict the hash code have the minimum redundancy. Okay, so this is the graph hashing work, and the previous method, uh, such as factor hashing and anchor graph hashing, uh, both uh, double the problem as a continuous relaxed problem. And these solutions are, we first solve the spectral solutions, particularly the, uh, the lowest eigenvectors of graph Laplace, and do discretization, okay, mostly by stress holding. And in this work, we're going to optimize a tractable discrete problem by using discrete optimization methods and achieve direct discrete solution instead of the thresholded spectral solutions, okay? And this is our object functions of the discrete graph hashing framework. We minimize, minimize the previous introduced graph Laplace term, plus we penalize the distance from the binary code B to the omega. This omega okay, integrate the balance and the uncorrelated constraint, okay? So we minimize the graph Laplace term, plus we minimize the distance from B to omega. Okay, this problem can be decomposed to two sub-problems, the B sub-problem and the Y sub-problem. Okay, firstly, the B sub-problem is given Y without B. And all we have a, a convex and a quadratic objective function FB, and maximum this one can be reduced to maximize a local linearized function F hat. Okay, maximum local linear F hat is very easy to do. We can get an elegant update as B plus J plus one. Okay, it's equal to sign of the previous function F, the gradient after the BJ. Okay, for the Y sub problem, okay, likely we have a closed form optimal and global optimal based on the SVD of the matrix JB. Okay. So overall, this problem is a nonlinear mixed integer problem, and we propose two specialized initial point to start the discrete optimization. And lastly, we propose as match out of sample hardship. Okay, this is our result. On this public YouTube feed set, our method, two versions, consider achieve the higher search accuracy in terms of apps measure. Thank for everyone. Please come to our post for more details. Next, we have Wei Zhu Chen, who is going to talk about large scale BFGS using MapReduce. Hello, everyone. My name is Wei Zhu. 
and this is John Wu with my colleague Zheng Hao Wang and Jin Nan Zhou in Microsoft. And so today I want to talk about some very well-known optimization method at BFGS. And the difference is how we do it in many videos with billions of features with a very limited resource. So as you can see for the traditional LBFGS, here is three of the work, very famous work in the, to make the LBFGS run on the main views. And so you can see all the gradient calculation is in a distributed way. But the problem is the LBFGS direction step, the direction is calculated in a central place. So, and this is the bottom line of all this angle. So, but we can see that, and this bottom line is depends on the number of the features. For the last scale feature, like billing scale feature is very common. For example, for the, some algo like logistic regression. So if we use one, only one billion features, so, if we, so we can calculate that, okay, we need 88 gigabyte memory to store all the historical information for the LBFGS when you calculate the direction. But in our main reduce environment, you only have maybe 10, 10 gigabytes of memory. And this is the motivation we tried to do this work two years ago. And this limitation is definitely depends on the number of the features. So that's why we propose this work is called the vector-free LBFGS. What I mean for the vector-free is that the main procedure in the LBFGS is independent of the number of the features. So it means that you can calculate billions of features and maybe in a one gigabyte memory, that's okay. So, and the second one of this work is about its mathematical equivalent. It's not approximation. The accuracy should be the same. And it's also scalable to billions of features. And the last one is, uh, actually we have a distributed machine learning library running on about one million of VM in our cluster. And this happened to be the most important optimization method because in my experience, LBFGS is very, very stable compared with some other algo. Maybe the convergence is not as great as others. And this is one of the experimental results. So you can see that in the traditional LBFGS, we can only run to 200 million of feature. But for this new one, one billion feature is no problem. So welcome to see you in our poster, number five. Thank you. The next speaker is Guang Tsan Lu, who's gonna talk about recovery of coherent data via low, low rank dictionary pursuit. Thank you, everybody. Uh, in this work, we start the problem of low rank matrix recovery. Given a uh, dead matrix X generated by L0 plus S0, we want to recover both S0, L0 and S0. L0 is assumed to be low rank, and uh, S0 is assumed to be sparse. To solve this problem, a preferred method is the RPCA by Candice et al. Uh, RPCA is about this complex program. Under certain conditions, RPCA can exactly recover both L0 and uh, S0. This is real less. Uh, the this condition, regarding L0 is uh, rank L0 smaller than N of log mu log n square, where mu is the coherence of L0. Uh, there are two coherence parameters defined on L0, mu1 and mu2, and uh, mu is the maximum of mu1 and mu2. So it is easy to see that this uh, RPC has an issue because the, the success condition is larger than when, whenever mu goes large, right? Particularly, if mu reach is up bound n, then this, this uh, success condition is invalid because the right side is uh, smaller than one. What is more, we have empirically found that the coherent premise actually increases as the class number on the line L0. Uh, this is not, not so good because this means the, uh, the performance of RPCA could be reduced by the widely exist cluster structure. So in this work, we would like to try to remove the dependence on coherence. However, this is not easy because, for example, uh, it's actually very, actually impossible to entirely remove the dependence on coherence. This, uh, this example explains why. 
Fortunately, we, our data has some useful problems to make it, for us to make use. That is, we find that v1 is always small and uh, v2 might be large. In this case, we have a convenient approach to solve the problem. Our idea is to learn the proper dictionary for LRR. The dictionary A in LRR has an important rule. When A calls the identity, LRR is, is RPCA. If A is uh, satisfied this low rank condition, then we prove that LRR does not depend on the, on the second coherent parameters. And empirically, you find our, uh, our, our method shows some distinct improvement of RPCA. Thank you for your attention, and we'll come to our post. Finally, we have Austin Benson, who's gonna talk about scalable methods for non-negative matrix factorization. Hi, so this is a joint work with my fellow student, Jason Lee, and with Bartek Rajwa and David Gleick from Purdue. Uh, what we're interested in is scaling up non-negative matrix factorizations, particularly in the domain where the matrix has many more rows than columns, uh, which we call tall and skinny matrices, and also in the domain where we're looking for what are called separable uh, matrix factorizations. The computation is actually pretty simple um, to explain. What we're looking for is to find a few columns of a non-negative matrix that represent the data in a non-negative way. So we're trying to find a few what we call extreme columns in some interpolation matrix such that combined these provide a non-negative low rank factorization. So the key uh, tool that we use is a singular value decomposition. Um, in particular, what we show is that we really only need the singular values and the right singular vectors uh, in order to do these factorizations. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, V transpose is not necessarily non-negative. In fact, it has negative entries. Um, but really the, the key insight is that the underlying orthogonal transformation going on here is that it preserves the convex geometry that a lot of existing algorithms use. Um, and some of those algorithms have been proposed here at NIPS recently. Um, so really, the overall algorithm is to take uh, sigma and V transpose and then use standard NMF algorithms. Um, so we can use this to scale up to some of the largest NMF uh, uh, computations to date. Uh, so why would you ever want to do this? Well, we have two applications that we looked at in particular. Um, the first is a scientific computing application. So in this case, the rows of the matrix correspond to different points in a stainless steel brick and the columns correspond to different simulations. And the entries in the data matrix uh, correspond to temperatures in those simulations over a period of time. And the second application we look at comes from bioinformatics. It's a flow cytometry application. Uh, and so in this application, the rows of the matrix are pairs of blood cells. The columns correspond to bands um, that also correspond to antibodies. Um, and the data entries correspond to the fl fluorescent intensity at those bands for those cells. And these are, in general, like terabyte size matrices. So look forward to seeing you at my poster. This concludes the spotlight session. The conference will reconvene at 2 p.m. <laughs>